the fact TLC used to be called the Learning Channel feels like the perfect encapsulating story to describe the downfall of cable television. Welcome to Labor Games. Oh my. Is this crazy? In the past 15 years, TLC has gone from one of the most forgetful channels in your basic cable package to one of the most brain rotting exploitative channels on TV. The sacrifices that I made to love you. Like other channels such as the History Channel or Music Television, MTV, TLC seems to be in a long line of channels that abandoned their original content niche. Like, what do I learn from watching this? TLC was created to empower underserved communities, but the channel seems to have fallen so far as to exploit the very people it was originally created to serve. Once upon a time, the Learning Channel strived to create access for both college and career education. Through both local and federal partnerships, the Learning Channel created educational content with real world results, hoping to be a warm beacon of light in the cold, wet, dank television landscape. An educated citizenry has always been the bedrock of this country. TLC slipping into degeneracy has much to do with the decline of cable TV as it has to do with the fall of publicly funded television and education. Yeah, this is Billiam, and welcome to the third and final part in my exploration of TLC, formerly known as The Learning Channel. First, we covered their lies, then we dove into their massive catalog of ridiculous, exploitative modern shows, and now we're gonna tell the story of why it's even called The Learning Channel in the first place. Today, we'll go back in time as we discover the NASA experiments that birthed TLC, along with the complicated story of how it fell into the hands of the Discovery Channel, who lost the channel's identity before discovering how to get TLC to stand out in the crowd. A discovery that was made by destroying a family John, Kate, their twins, and their sextuplets. This is the story of how The Learning Channel covertly became TLC. You're watching The Learning Channel. Thank you so much to Exter for sponsoring this video. These guys heard that I'm always losing my wallet and told me about their sleek trackable wallet. And now they're making sustainable bags and other accessories. So now you can keep track of your stuff and get more out of your day. I spend so much time looking for all the essentials that I misplace around my house. On top of the solar powered tracking device that lets you track your wallet's location from your phone, Exter wallets have a super slim design that's half the size of normal wallets, but will still hold over 12 cards. And that's in addition to cash. They're also made from sustainable materials like vegan Italian leather and space grade aluminum. Your move, NASA. I asked Exter for both the Senate and Parliament wallets, both in Juniper Green, along with this aluminum card holder in olive. I love how sleek all three of them look, and I'm really into the muted green colors right now. They aren't bulky, and it's super easy to access all of my cards with just the push of a button. And with the Exter tracker card, I'll always know where it is. Look how thin this thing is. There's also exclusive bundles with key cases, cash clips, and premium gift bags. Exter's next online sale starts August 24th and goes till September 7th. You can get up to 25% off then. I've partnered with Exter to give you an exclusive discount. You can enjoy 25% off using my code Billium or by clicking the link in the description. Thank you so much for listening to the sponsorship and thank you to Exter for sponsoring this video. The birth of TLC begins with the birth of satellite television. By the early 1960s, new breakthroughs in orbital and radio technologies began to create a lot of potential to expand communication capabilities across the world. Geostationary satellites follow the rotation of the Earth, enabling global communication and consistent broadcast coverage for an entire geographic region. Improving radio technologies enabled high quality color television broadcasts to be sent from space. From 1966 to 1974, NASA launched six experimental satellites dubbed the Application Technology Satellites. ATS-1 is a celebrity. This dude took some of the first cloud covered images of Earth's entire body. Obviously from one two dimensional perspective, this is called the disc of Earth, but it was also used to connect the United States to the famous Our World television program, coordinated with 26 different countries in 1967. In that same year, ATS-3, two years before the moon landing, provided the first color images of Earth. But this story is about the final satellite of the program, ATS-6, arriving in 1970. 
1974. The NASA ATS-6. With the express purpose of the satellite being for delivering high quality educational content. One of the remarkable features of this satellite was the 10 meter paraboloid antenna. Alaska received televised medical information. In the Rocky Mountains, junior high school students received career education. And in the Appalachian region, televised graduate level courses were accessed via sites across the region accredited by partnering institutions. All of these places were, and some still are, considered to be education deserts. Places lacking options for career training and community college level education. But with satellite technology, these communities can be easily served. Each class was a 30 minute produced lecture that included take home audio materials that the students could use as homework. The program was a success, but NASA had plans to move the ATS satellite to help the Indian space program develop their own. So the Appalachian Regional Commission, a partnership between counties in the Appalachian region and the federal government, had purchased the broadcast channels NASA had been using along with services from a commercial satellite company. The Appalachian Community Service Network incorporated into a private nonprofit TV channel and continued to receive support from the ARC and the U.S. Office of Education. By 1982, ACSN had turned into the American Community Service Network, subtitled the Learning Channel. ACSN provided over 3,300 hours of programming annually to the entire country with 70 accredited partners offering educational programs from GEDs to graduate level courses. That's right, you used to actually be able to educate yourself by watching TLC. Now you realize American education failed by watching TLC. By 1982, the channel had achieved national syndication. Quote, programs included workshops and special offerings to serve a growing constituency in the fields of health, business, and social services, which takes full advantage of television, radio, tape recordings, and cinema techniques. Programs will be made available to all citizens with an emphasis placed on the needs of underserved populations in rural and non-metropolitan areas. However, despite the success, the Appalachian Regional Commission quickly realized they did not have the resources to produce and serve content to a national audience. And thus, by 1986, the Appalachian Regional Commission sold their stake of the Learning Channel to in Infotech television. Still, the channel strived to create educational content in a sea of uneducated drivel. The TLC chairman and CEO had a strong statement to the public on what the mission of TLC was in 1990. As Jefferson said, any society that believes that it can be both free and ignorant believes in what never was nor ever will be. Despite being owned by a profit-driven company, the Learning Channel believed they were providing a service still. But even almost a decade into the Learning Channel, they were only taking in about a million dollars in profit annually, showing that their growth was not necessarily driven by a profit motive. But by 1991, financial pressures would cause the channel to collapse. With the loss of their public funding, Infotech had to sell their assets in order to pay off creditors. And in a purchase that shocked the industry, the Discovery Channel, then a small player in the game would purchase the Learning Channel. A few months after the purchase in April of 1991, Variety reported, Discovery's chairman and CEO, John Hendricks, says the plan is to build TLC into television's foremost educational tool. Some of the first shows aired under Discovery's TLC included Great Books, which aired in 1993 and featured creative people like George Lucas being interviewed about the impact of literary classics. Paleo World from 1994 is a series about paleontologists and dinosaurs. I saw Paleo World, but not as Paleo World, but as a re-edited version for kids called Boneheads, detectives of the Paleo World. I vividly remember renting a VHS tape of this show when I was a kid, and I spent years looking for this. The only way I could think to describe the show was it had two young hosts, and I'm not the only one who spent years looking for it. Quite a few episodes of this show are lost media, so if you have copies of them, you might just help the public make this show complete. New TLC, produced basic cooking and gardening shows, along with some less sensational dips into the unscripted reality show format. As TLC rebranded once again with the slogan, Life Unscripted. A baby story, a wedding story, a makeover story, a dating story, all have storylines you could easily imagine. But then it did quickly get weird and sensational. In the old days, I'd be king of the harem. And I'd be a fertility goddess. Discovery Channel had Shark Week, but TLC had Alien Invasion Week. One of their most popular programs from the 90s was The Human Animal and was an up close documentary look at sex. Human sex, and it'll be burned into my mind forever. I saw a fully erect penis on the thermal camera. C caught on the thermal cam. TLC, thermal lit c 
The whole show is narrated by a guy trying to act objective, looking at the human animal as if he were an outside observer. Anatomically, the human animal is unusual to say the least. Its lack of hair is unique among primates. I saw the most detailed nipple under a macro lens. I saw an internal camera witnessing the female orgasm and its function in reproduction. It has one. I've witnessed sperm working together to kill rival sperm so the chosen ones may get into the egg. Somebody got pregnant to film this. P lips kissing uncensored and on YouTube. There's a titty in the thumbnail. Are you learning now? I can't unlearn it. Admittedly, TLC did censor some of this in America, but Europe aired it as is. Though I was much more shocked to see real crime scene photos on forensics files, which yes, did start on TLC. Trauma Life in the ER was marketed as the real life version of the drama ER. The dashing doctors of the ER. Single gunshot wound to the right. He's not George Clooney. You mean me? He's better and would not shy away from filming blood, gore, and actual death. There was good content sprinkled in there for sure, but quickly the definition of what learning was widened. Sure, these programs could be seen as informative, but it was clear that sensationalism had overcome education as the channel's priority. Discovery's first major step in creating a new brand for TLC was the premiere of Ready, Set, Learn in 1992. Ready, Set, Learn was a programming block targeting children two to six, featuring commercial free programming with musical segments between shows hosted by children's entertainer Rory Zuckerman. Rory, a mother herself, was quickly hired by TLC executive John Ford when he saw her rapport with children attending her live musical show, and I understand why immediately. Rory would sing alongside her puppet hosts Reddy, Duncan, and Buster the Alligator. Watching old clips, Rory genuinely seems to have a charismatic spirit perfect for children's entertainment, bringing a very sincere musical sensibility to the songs she writes and performs. In interviews, Rory was very passionate about her place within the world of children's entertainment. In regards to her kids, she said, I'm pretty particular about what they can watch. I think kids are very heavily influenced by what they see. Some stuff that my little one sometimes will flip around to is so inappropriate that I immediately make him change it. I wish I could always be there to see it. Initially under Discovery, TLC wanted to make content for all ages and have this family friendly image except for the sex show. And Rory would eventually get her own program, Rory's World, many episodes of which are now considered to be lost media. But to many, she remains one of the most prominent figures in the channel's history. At the beginning of Ready, Set, Learn, TLC imported a lot of shows, including the Canadian-made Book Mice. Book Mice! After watching all of these exploitive shows for this TLC series, I am so f***ing happy to talk about Book Mice. Book Mice. It's a Canadian-made show about mice living in the public library, and the theme song sounds a lot like DuckTales. <laughs> It reminds me a lot of PBS's Between the Lions, which would air quite a few years later. I wish puppets were still a big thing. That's what I've learned today. Also on Canada, Beekman's World aired on TLC in September of 92. It's a wacky science education show with a vibrant high sensory set, the perfect environment to make science fun. And interestingly, it's actually a predecessor to Bill Nye the Science Guy, which would air the next September in 93. Early on, there were a lot of strange Eastern European cartoons between shows, which I always vibe with, but JJ the Jet Plane, that was all TLC. Even though most people remember this show to have aired on PBS, it actually aired on TLC a few years earlier. But what a lot of people don't know about this aerodynamic unholy beast that wears the face of your unborn child is it started as a popular VHS tape. My mouth dropped when I saw JJ's beta design. How can you look one month old and 77 years old at the same time? The videotape was created in 1994 and used real model planes inspired by Thomas the Tank Engine. But Thomas and friends don't have fleshy colored faces. They're not human. Human. What experiment created these things? And they act like Savannah, the jet, is supposed to be sexy. <clears throat> Seeing you here tonight brings to mind, uh, it uh, brings to mind. Uh, she bats her eyelashes oh, at him. Shucks, this speech is boring. You don't choke on your words when you're talking about an airplane. Welcome home, my dear. Thanks, Easy. You're still sweet as sugar cane, she said. TLC's CGI update of JJ is famously off-putting. The helicopter is the ugliest 3D model ever made, and that is saying something. The helicopter looked way better in the old version, and Savannah the Jet is no longer sexy. <gasps> she was never sexy, 
Stupid me. Come 2003, Ready, Set, Learn rebranded itself and got a new little animated host who I love, Paz the Penguin. Alongside a lot of new shows like Peep in the Big Wide World and the Jim Henson Company produced Animal Jam. But a lot of shows of this era would actually be shifted to Discovery Kids. They were sort of competing with themselves now. So hot take, like, a ridiculously hot take, but I think Bozark from Animal Jam is the coolest Muppet ever, or at least the coolest Muppet at this very moment. And although he's not a Muppet, Hip Hop Harry gave him a run for his money. He showed up in 2006 giving us bangers like, go, 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 who's next? Where Hip Hop Harry gets outdanced by all these children doing the sickest moves you've ever seen. Just doing flips and shit all the time. Who's next? Hip Hop Harry's the most intense hype beast I've ever seen. Water's just what I need. <laughs> You're welcome. Pass him down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, that was just a little weird, Harry. I won't lie to you. Oh, whoa, he's dancing with Snoop Dogg on Twitter. And yeah, Elon, I still call it Twitter. TLC in the early 2000s was a place for makeovers. Whether it was your ugly house or your ugly style, TLC was there to make it worse. All with the confidence that they know what's hot and what's not. TLC adapted What Not To Wear, originally a British show, which taught people how to dress and how to throw out their old looks. No wonder why people who grew up watching this hate themselves. And she's binned those sexless aging clothes in favor of something infinitely more flattering. At least they weren't literally putting people in glass boxes for the public to gawk at like on 10 years younger. How old do you think Faleen looks? Six or so. Another popular makeover show was the BBC's Changing Room and TLC would turn it into trading spaces. Neighbors redesigning each other's houses with assistance from designers who are just so quirky. Open your eyes and see what it looks like. Oh my God. Hey, all along the walls with a vibrant pink ceiling. Okay. I'm glad you could tell it was straw because we didn't straw. weren't sure you'd even know for sure what it was. It's straw. It's straw. It's straw. They really hate it because that is the normal response to this. I really love how awful some of these redesigns look. I think a thousand dollars was just the right price to get people to be bold with their redesigns, but not have enough money to go through with anything. <laughs> They should have given them $100. The restraint would have made things better. Like some new paint, a couple extra tchotchkes, a lamp. Sometimes that's all you need to pull a room together. I'd watch a 45 minute program that climaxes with a new lamp. That's pretty much what it was. <laughs> I'm gonna have to leave the room now. You're that disappointed. Well, I'm gonna have to leave. Yeah, that's... Boy, she's not happy. She's really not happy. Robotica was a popular robotic battle competition show, but then Take Home Chef features a chef approaching women at the supermarket and going home with them and his crew of 20 plus people all to make a nice little meal. I think at this point they were starting to have an identity crisis, but TLC struck gold with shows like Say Yes to the Dress, which still airs today alongside Little People Big World, which began a year earlier in 2006. Little People Big World was TLC's first major show documenting a family. The New York Times explained, TLC is billing Little People Big World as the most comprehensive television documentary ever about the lives of little people. Amy Roloff, 43, said in an interview, I'm just a regular person who happens to be little. The biggest concern for the parents was how Zach would be depicted in the series. And now the show has run for 24 seasons. I'm not sure there's another reality show that follows a family that has run that long. I, I seriously don't think so. This program, like a lot of other TLC shows, unfortunately has a disturbing side, so if you don't want to hear about a sexual assault incident, please skip to the end of this section. There are chapter markers in the description. Jacob Roloff, who was nine at the start of the show, would exit for a few reasons, the least of which being he believed his parents were dishonest versions of themselves on the show, very typical of TLC's reality shows. But more importantly, Jacob later admitted that one of the producers on the show assaulted him when he was a child. But with respect to the others involved in the show, there has been nothing but support for his decision from his family, TLC, and the fans of the show. Yet I keep finding myself wishing he just was never put in that position in the first place. Very quickly under Discovery, TLC had kind of lost its identity. Airing shows similar to those airing on History, a and &E, PBS Kids, and even other Discovery-owned channels. There were definitely things that worked for them, but nothing really anchored the channel. In 2004, the news cycle became fascinated by Kate Gosselin, 
who, with her husband John, were expecting sex tuplets, as in Kate was pregnant with six kids at once. The public fascination led to the family being approached by Discovery Health to film a one-hour documentary, Surviving Sex Tuplets and Twins, which aired in 2006. Yet, as quickly as the producers were let in the door, they would push another agenda. The special with John and Kate was Discovery Health's biggest program, so the Discovery quickly got the family to accept filming a full time reality show which would move to TLC. John and Kate plus eight. She was probably, I'm sorry, can you stop breathing so loud, honey? He's okay. Going from a channel that was in 20 million homes to a channel that was in 90 million homes homes, skyrocketing the family into fame. John, Kate, and their children were now celebrities and people were obsessed with the dynamic of the couple. Millions of people were tuning in every week to catch a glimpse of the seemingly perfect family somehow able to raise eight children, which made the idea of them having marital problems all the more interesting. Tabloids began reporting on rumors that John had been unfaithful. Speculations of their divorce were quickly on the rise. Headlines were screaming John is sleeping with the school teacher, making Kate into a victim left to raise eight kids without John. People were engrossed in their drama, which all led to the final season of the show. The finale of the season where they announced their divorce received 9.8 million viewers, which is crazy for basic cable. This was twice the amount of the series previous ratings high. The audience liked the family, but they loved the divorce. However, viewers were being fed a delayed narrative. During the middle of season four, John and Kate had already separated, but viewers were watching them renew their vows in Hawaii. John wanted his family to walk away from the show, but Kate and TLC disagreed and waged a media war against him. Pink John as this erratic person for turning down so much money. The network allegedly offered John $1 million to continue to pretend to be married to his ex-wife. According to John, he even received expressed permission from Kate that if they were to do this, that he would be allowed to see other people, all for the sake of the show. He turned them down so TLC let the entire world believe that he was a cheater. But in reality, he just wasn't allowed to reveal their separation because it was John and Kate plus eight spoilers. His own own life spoilers but that didn't stop the rest of the media from preemptively attacking him both parents had different ideas about the show in regard to their children john on larry king would claim that he had an epiphany about the production i had an epiphany one day i just looked in the mirror and i said i, I don't want to be this person anymore i don't want them to film anymore i don't think it's healthy for them and i the reason i don't think it's healthy for them is that we're going through a divorce right now and i don't think it should be televised and i think my kids should be taken off the show tlc sued john goslin in october of 2009 claiming he failed to meet his obligations as an exclusive employee of the network making unauthorized public disclosures about the show which they described as erratic behavior tlc issued this statement remain deeply disappointed at his continued erratic behavior and his latest comments are grossly inaccurate, without merit, and clearly opportunistic. Despite John Gosselin's repeated self-destructive and unprofessional actions, he remains under exclusive contract with TLC. Gosselin filed a countersuit claiming TLC violated Pennsylvania's child labor laws in filming John and Kate Plus 8, and he publicly posted a sign on the gate of his home saying no film crew or production staff from TLC is permitted on this property under penalty of trespass. He thought the process was bad for his kids and the family already made a really good chunk of change. But as a couple, John and Kate were apparently pulling in over a hundred $180 million a quarter for TLC, a big leap for the company that was once struggling to make a million dollars annually. Even Kate's family was speaking out against her actions. Her brother and sister-in-law claimed they both believed filming of the children was exploitation, her own family. TLC funded Kate's divorce lawyers, guaranteeing her win of custody, and John lost his own lawsuit and was put under a 10-year gag order, silencing him, all while Kate plus eight would continue with Kate, now painted as an independent media personality. She would make media rounds constantly just to let everyone know nothing was really going on. I think Joy Barr's nihilistic take on The View really helps encapsulate the entire situation. Now you are winning the PR awards because of this story about the baby 
center. I'm not really and out to win. Also coming on the show and being awards. sweet. I see what As you're you saying. Are. I'm not out to win any awards. This family's entire dissolution, a PR battle. At least Joy Barr seems to be pretty open about the fact that TLC was waging war against one of their ex-employees. Taylor Swift even played Kate on SNL. Hi. Doing a bit about her, her press rounds. Actually, that's right. I'm doing lots of press. And after his gag order was lifted, John had some comments about what he believed Kate's pop culture impact to be. She's the Karen meme. She is the, <laughs> like, <laughs> hello. You are so funny. Actually, you know what else is funny? How I got this hairstyle. The newly single mother and her eight children would remain in the limelight. After Kate's appearance on Dancing with the Stars, her partner Tony revealed to Anderson Cooper that Kate was controlling and demeaning during their rehearsals. He walked out several times and had to go to therapy after the show. And he's not the only one claiming to have needed therapy after being around Kate. Recently, her son Colin Goslin, one of the sex tuplets who isn't on speaking terms with his mother, told Entertainment Tonight how she wrongfully institutionalized him, claiming that he has special needs, even though he was never diagnosed with anything. According to Colin, he just didn't want to film anymore. After discovering where Colin was, John would be granted emergency custody of both Colin and his sister Hannah, who decided she didn't want to be around her mother anymore after finding out where her brother was for three years, which apparently was kept from the rest of the family. John, Hannah, and Colin have recently opened up to Vice in an interview. He just didn't want to film anymore. All this news sparked new tabloids accusing Kate of being an abusive mother, which she firmly denies. Investigated many times. It's always unfounded, obviously. So they're all unfounded? Yes, absolutely. In 2011, due to the controversy surrounding Colin, TLC would ultimately cancel Kate Plus 8, leaving Kate alone to capitalize on her celebrity for years. She tried going on multiple reality programs, including Celebrity Apprentice. I really feel it's your time, Kate. You're fired. <laughs> It's very sad to see that the family's story is still being used in this publicized battle. Nonetheless, the destruction of the Goslin family gave TLC a formula to copy. More big families that the audience would watch waiting to blow up like Lightning McQueen crashing in Cars 3. It's just inevitable. At Discovery Health, the family was tapped for reality TV by executive Eileen O'Neill. O'Neill holds a master's in pop culture studies from Bowling Green University. So that kind of tells you how critical health was to Discovery Health. After John and Kate began, Eileen O'Neill would be promoted internally at Discovery to head the much larger TLC, where she would continue to bring powerhouse shows to the network like Honey Boo Boo and Breaking Amish. But despite the network making 180 million a quarter, the family was only paid just over $20,000 an episode. Keep in mind, this show was exploding in popularity during the 2007 to 2008 Hollywood writer strike. While written content suffered, reality Reality shows exploded with success. In a 2013 Washington Post article regarding Honey Boo Boo, the story of which we talked about in the last video, Eileen O'Neill was asked what worries her about her channel at 3 a.m. Ratings, she admitted. I wonder how she feels about the divorce since it got such good ratings. She can't have her cake and eat it too. But we wouldn't really know how she feels because at the time, the head of PR at TLC had a strict no comment policy that the channel has seemed to continue with. They want this crazy content to speak for itself. In 2011, the current Warner Brother Discovery CEO, David Zaslav, then head of just regular old Discovery pre-merger, announced Eileen would also be given the job to oversee Discovery and TLC together as a group president. TLC was once an educational aid created for those who didn't have access to it. Now it's exploited the lives of so many people for the sake of brand recognition. When promoted in 2011, O'Neill said of her job to Adweek, one of my favorite challenges is to find those great characters that people will love or hate and those great stories that keep you engaged across all platforms. We are thrilled to create these shows and to be a part of the pop culture zeitgeist. Around the world, TLC was known as Discovery Travel and Living and later rebranded to TLC, the Travel and Living channel. To so many people around the world and now in America, they had no idea TLC was ever even called the Learning Channel. It's just this zany part of American pop culture. Although O'Neill has since left Discovery, now David Zasloff has since been put in charge of even more of Hollywood. After turning Discovery, one of the smallest players in the entertainment industry, 
and to one of the largest media corporations publicly traded today, all by exploiting talent and having no regard for the channel's reputation. Right now, as I'm saying this in 2023, there is a dual strike happening in Hollywood. Both the actors and the writers are striking against David Zaslav and other corporate executives who seem to want to make Discovery and TLC's exploitative standards standard across the industry. And it's all because people can't look away from car wrecks. Ka-chow. See ya.